So chapter 13, starting at verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judah? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Thanks, Jilly. Uh, do keep that passage open. Uh, let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these parables that we've been looking at over the previous weeks. And uh, we pray for this uh, closing part of this section today, that you'd speak to us, you'd remind us of your uh, true gospel and how we are to respond. Uh, we pray that Jesus would not just amaze us, but would amaze us and we would respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, we've reached uh, the end of uh, this major section in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, this whole section began back in chapter 10, as you can see on the screen. And it's been charting all sorts of different responses to Jesus and his proclamation, his Gospel. Uh, so back in chapter 10, uh, he sends out the 12 disciples. This is uh, 10 verse 5 and 8 on the screen. Jesus sent, out, uh, sent the 12 out with the following instruction. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter at any town of the Samaritans. So don't go outside of the Jewish Israelite communities. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. And how are they? How is that message received? Uh, well, there will be a few who respond well, a few worthy people where the disciples will stay and live with them uh, on their travels. But on the whole, they are to expect to be persecuted, arrested, called to account, threatened. And so they move on. Uh, in fact, Jesus, is, Jesus promises his disciples uh, when he, as he sends them out, uh, chapter 10, verse 28, that they're, they're likely to face death itself at some point so matthew 10 28 do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell it's not going to be a great response uh, even john the baptist the one who prepares the way for jesus isn't quite sure how to respond to jesus in chapter 11 and he sends his own disciples to jesus and, and ask basically, are you the one? Uh, so this is Matthew 11, verse 2 and 3. John was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah. So he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Well, they're sent back to John by Jesus. Uh, and Jesus basically just says, just look at what I'm doing. Look at what's happening. Uh, you will see I am the promised one of the Messiah from my actions. Uh, we trust that John the Baptist responds well uh, and rightly to Jesus and his message. But Jesus continues throughout that chapter with these little glimpses of people who may respond well. He continues to condemn the majority of Israel as for rejecting him as savior of, of the world. So chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed. So the signs of who he was, because they did not repent. It's an important word. Jesus says expecting repentance as he proclaims and travels, but they're not. And we get to the end of chapter 12, uh, which appears to be like a little bookend uh, when paired with today's passage, either end of the parables, where Jesus' own family, his mother and brothers, are outside of what's going on, and they're calling Jesus out. Seems that maybe they're a little bit embarrassed 
Uh, they're not quite sure what he's up to, and they want, to, want him to come out and give an account to them. And Jesus actually says, end of chapter 12, uh, for whoever does, this is verse 50, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And then we have these parables, which we've been looking at over the past week, where Jesus is explaining secrets about the kingdom of heaven that weren't known before. Uh, the main message being that the kingdom is coming in two stages, uh, a now and a not yet type kingdom. It's not what you expected, he's telling the people of the time. Uh, Jesus has come now as a suffering servant to represent, as we've been learning in the catechisms, to represent humanity before God because he lives a perfectly obedient life because he's fully God. And then he dies in our place as a man, takes the full wrath of God on himself for those who repent and believe and follow him as a disciple. And so that's the kingdom that he brings now. And if you believe in that and repent, you have joy. We see that in the parables. We have joy because we know the kingdom is ours, even though we wait for the full treasure of it. When judgment will take place when the weeds and the wheat will be separated, when the fish and the net will be sorted. The wicked, those that refuse Jesus as king, those who have failed to repent for their sins, well, they will be thrown into burning fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the kingdom comes to fruition, when Jesus returns. And the righteous, those who have been made righteous through Jesus and his death and resurrection on the cross because they have humbled themselves and repented of their sins, accepting Jesus as Lord, well, they will inherit perfect eternity with Jesus. They'll have the treasure hidden in the field, the finest pearl of them all. It'll be theirs now and forever. And then when Jesus ends this section on Jesus' parables, he returns to those who are closest to him to his hometown, to his own flesh and blood. Now, has anything changed? Now that they've been warned of the judgment to come, now that they've seen that there's all these kind of responses to Jesus and most of them find his condemnation at the end times, uh, we reach our passage. Chapter 13, verse 54 in your Bibles. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Now, it looks a bit hopeful, doesn't it? Uh, they are amazed by Jesus. There's no question about it. This Jesus is amazing. And in a small town like Nazareth was, the synagogue, synagogue would be the true hub of the town. Everyone would have heard that Jesus was coming back and gone to listen. Everyone knows what's going on. This is incredible. How did, he, how did he get so wise and impressive? Where is all this power that he has coming from? He can even heal people and do miracles. Maybe he did one or two of the miracles there and then with them. Maybe they just heard the reports coming from the surrounding towns in Galilee. But you can imagine it, can't you? In this small town, everyone knows who Jesus is and what's going on. They all grew up together. They all know one another. Everyone knows everyone. Uh, we used to live in a small town in South Africa, uh, and one of the cafes had a sign outside of it saying this. The good thing about living in a small village is that if you don't know what you're doing tomorrow, everyone else does. There's no hiding. There's no privacy. Everyone knows everything. And no one knows how Jesus gained such power. Where did he get this wisdom? We all know him. Uh, this is not just Jesus having a good knowledge of the Torah, the first five books of the Jewish text, of the Old Testament. Uh, people are constantly amazed by the authority that Jesus teaches with, his wisdom, his authority, his powers, his miracles when he preaches. Where did Jesus get his wisdom and his power from? That's their question. They don't question that he has it, they question its source. It's obvious he has it. They question his source. It's sad today, isn't it, that uh, 
Despite the overwhelming for the evidence for the existence of Jesus, uh, despite the overwhelming evidence that by the nature of his teaching still being available today, over 2,000 years later, they had to have power and authority, didn't they? Nothing else stands the time like that. Despite even non-biblical historical texts confirming that people saw and followed and, and saw miracles happening, despite all that, people are not amazed at Jesus today. Many doubt that he even had wisdom and power. <coughs> at least the people at this time didn't doubt that he had wisdom and power. How could you deny it when it's right there before you? Even if sadly, despite his wisdom and his power, they're far too familiar and far too proud to accept Jesus as Lord. They're amazed. But let's see. What happens next? Verse uh, 53 uh, in our passage. Uh, we've read the first bit. Where did this man get his wisdom and his power? They asked him, This isn't the carpent isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name, Mary, and aren't his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get these things? Are they, are they amazed? Well, they're amazed. But what does it turn into? They took offense at him. They're so familiar with Jesus that they're offended. Those most familiar with Jesus appeared to be the most resistant to hear his message about the kingdom. His offer of salvation. His call, as we've heard, to repent and believe. So that they might be spared the wrath of God that is to come and be saved. Who does this guy think he is? Telling us this and that about the kingdom, calling us to repent, showing us his wisdom and his power. He's just that kid from down the road. But we all know his mother, Mary, and his brothers, James. Look, he's over there. Joseph, Simon and Judas, I'm sure I saw them this morning. Look, here are some of his sisters right here with us. I won't have this young man lecture me and claim some sort of authority over us. Uh, we don't know what Jesus taught in the synagogue on that occasion in his hometown. Uh, no doubt he would have done what is typical. He would have opened God's word, the Old Testament for them, and he'd have explained it. But of course, the difference Jesus brings, as we see through the Gospels, when Jesus explains the Old Testament, he shows how it all points to him, the Messiah, how he fulfills it. And so as a listener, you're going to have to be humbled by that, aren't you? Or take offense. For you are sinners, he says, and you need a savior, he says. You're sinners who deserve judgment, he says. Sinners who must repent and believe in a Messiah who's here, who can save you. Here I am, says Jesus, repent and believe. Uh, perhaps he'd have repeated a similar sermon that's recorded in Luke's gospel. Uh, probably this is an earlier visit to his hometown, but he's in Nazareth again. I think it's on the screen. Yep, Luke 4, 16. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unfolding it, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone, you can imagine it, can't you? It's a standard reading. Everyone's heard this one before. Fasted on him. He began by saying to them, today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That is a claim. Here I am, says Jesus. The Messiah and King is here. And he would have called for repentance before God. And as Matthew records the beginning of Jesus' preaching ministry back in Matthew chapter 4, 17, he sets up this formula that's to 
uh, encompass all of Jesus's teaching throughout the gospel, all of the disciples teaching and all good Christian teaching and preaching today. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's quite a claim, isn't it? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, and it's all in me. I'm the one. Forget that, they say. You might be wise and powerful, uh, but we're a bit too proud to repent of our sins before you. You're just a carpenter's boy. And if I owe God an apology, uh, I don't think that's right. We're the chosen ones. We're familiar with God. I, I think I know who God is. Thank you. We're too familiar to bow down to Jesus and worship him, they say. And so Jesus ends by comparing the people in his own town by that all too familiar pattern of history and humanity. In verse 57, they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. All through the Old Testament, prophets were are given by God to call the people back to him in repentance. Turn from your ways. Come back to me, says God, through prophet after prophet. But the overwhelming pattern is that the people, humanity, from whom the prophet himself comes, reject the message and the messenger. Jeremiah abused and attacked. Ezekiel ridiculed. Prophet after prophet ignored because they're too familiar with the message. I think I know who God is, thank you. I don't need you coming and telling me. <laughs> the irony being they failed to answer the very question they'd been asking of Jesus uh, right at the beginning. The people listening to Jesus failed to answer the very question they were asking. Where did he get this wisdom and power from? They don't answer it. They just jump straight to dismissing him. I'm too proud. I don't want to know. But had they only given a bit of time and thought to this power and wisdom and answered their own question, perhaps they'd have realized that the wisdom and the power that he brings can only be from God himself in human form. The Messiah stood before them. Loving them enough to call them to repentance and faith. Loving them enough to come as a suffering servant to die in their place. Loving them enough to satisfy the wrath of God for them in their place. Offering them eternity, the treasure of eternity, the glorious kingdom of God with Jesus forevermore. If only they'd asked, answered the question they asked. I think I know God. I don't think I want to listen to this. Perhaps we're in a similar danger today. After being amazed by Jesus, but in an over-familiarity, not actually wanting to listen to his message. You see, the whole Galilean district, it's not just his hometown, on the whole will do that. They'll dismiss him. The whole Jewish nation, on the whole, will do that. They'll dismiss him. They'll even put him to death on a cross rather than answer the question, where does his wisdom and power come from? We don't need God's messenger. We're too proud. I think I know who God is myself. And so they miss not just the messenger, but the message. The message is the messenger in this case, the Messiah, the Savior, and they missed it all. So it may not be popular to keep on going on about the sinfulness and the rebellion of humanity against God. We may not like to hear how detestable and sinful and sin-ridden and dry-boned we are before God. But the parables we've been looking at over the last weeks, they don't pull any punches. There's burning and weeping and gnashing of teeth that awaits those who refuse to repent and follow Jesus. This is the message Jesus took out across uh, uh, the Middle East. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, the Messiah is here, it's me. They couldn't come out of that uh, sermon after Jesus preached. That was a nice message, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on with our day. No, they had to deal with it. They either were offended or they repented. 
and they chose offence. Jesus offends with his preaching, his gospel. We are sinners deserving of God's wrath and judgment. And so, of course, it's offensive to hear that and know that we have to repent before it's too late. We ought to find it a bit uncomfortable every time we look at Jesus. It ought to slightly unsettle us. It ought, uh, ought to make us reevaluate our lives and our lifestyles each day. Don't let over-familiarity with Jesus cause us not to hear his message. Perhaps we've grown up hearing much about Jesus. We just can't quite bring ourselves to bow down to this king one more time. He just lived 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross. I think I know God. I, I, I think I know him in my head. I'm better than him, we might think. I, I know his stories. I, I know all about him. I'm not going to bow today because I, I, I'm just going to do it my way. And so just like Jesus stops performing mir miraculous physical miracles in his hometown, so too he will stop performing spiritual miracles of forgiveness and new life in people's lives if we don't repent and follow him. Rather, we should be amazed at his wisdom and power. And rather than letting our over-familiarity with the Bible mean that we're offended or I don't, do I need to repent? Do I need to be reminded of my sin? Instead, the opposite ought to be true. We instead come in joyful repentance. Despite what we're like, despite our sin, despite our wickedness and our evil, despite our brokenness, our deadness in sin, our undeserving nature, the God of the entire universe came into the world like as a man, as the Lord Jesus. He loved us enough to offer himself in our place for everything we actually deserve. So that his true hope, hometown, that one in heaven in glory with, next to the Father, might become our hometown. Where with his disciples, we will become the very mother brother and sister of Jesus for all eternity. That is the kind of king we have. That is the king we are offered in Christ. And we can joyfully and gratefully receive that. We can give up our sin. We can change our lives. We can cast off everything that hinders so that we may inherit the prize for which he came and freely gave. <coughs> We're so busy, concerned about the unfairness of life or the pursuit of nice things, or, or a better life, or just the busyness of life and family, or the draw of friends, or even special friends. We're actually offended when we hear God call us to repentance for our sin, demanding our attention. Come back to me, he says. Open my word. See your sin. Repent and change. Turn around. Come back. But we're only offended because we think too highly of ourselves. And sub subconsciously, we're too familiar with Jesus. We think he's too demanding to call us to repent and follow him and take up our cross daily. When only the opposite is true of Jesus. The more we remember our desperate state before him, the more we realize he's offering us nothing but love and joy and hope and reward and blessing and glory. What a king he is. He didn't stand in the, in the synagogues preaching these messages that got him killed on a cross because he didn't love. Quite the opposite. He wouldn't have bothered. And so we can joyfully repent and follow. And what a joy he is to proclaim to all those around us as well. The Messiah is here. Repent and believe. I also just wonder whether our present culture that has become less and less familiar with Jesus actually offers us a sign of hope. As we look around and we sit in our offices and we talk with our neighbours, there's almost no concept of Jesus. People actually don't think they know who God is anymore. And maybe that's an opportunity. You see, it's not the Jews who think they know who God is that will respond in great numbers to the gospel after Jesus' death and resurrection. It is the rest of the world, all nations, the Gentiles. In fact, we begin with Jesus sending the disciples out only to the Jews. Don't go to the others. 
so that it could almost set up that contrast. Well, that didn't work. Look who's going to respond. All nations. En masse. Those who are humble enough, who don't think they know God that well, not blinded by their familiarity of who they think God is. And that's the, that's the world we live in now, in our country at least. I mean, look around the world. It is not the Christianized countries coming to Jesus en masse. It's the Muslim majority countries finding Jesus in their droves. It's China with the fastest growing church in history. And so maybe the loss of Christian teaching and principles in our own context. It's a great opportunity to speak to one another around us of Jesus. People are lost. They've got no form of religion that can help. So maybe, just maybe, people will respond when we tell them that Jesus calls you to repentance because he loves you and he will save you. Let me pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, forgive us uh, for thinking too highly of ourselves. We find ourselves offended at your truth at various levels, even when we've given our life to you. We struggle to make the right decisions, to trust the truth of your word, even when we don't like it. We fail to repent and to believe at every stage. Please forgive us. Humble us again. Let us see your truth and your glory. Forgive us so that we may live lives that truly represent your love. And we thank you that you gave up everything for us, not because of anything we've done, not because we've deserved it, just out of love and grace. May we be a repentant and a humble people who live in joy because we remember all that you've saved us from and for. May we take that message to all those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.